Today we're going to take a little different look at Philemon, and um, I, th I think it's going to be, um, who knows, what the Spirit of God might, might make it for us, right? Encouraging or challenging, convicting, whatever, that's his business. But I just want to remind you that here at Grace Life Bible Church, we are all about these values, okay? We want to know God and his word. We want to experience grace and forgiveness. That's, that's just who we are. We extend grace and forgiveness to each other. And so today we're, we're going to be focusing on that, forgiveness, also engagement and impact. Just like the 9 o'clock hour, we had Open Door Mission represented, and that's exactly, that fits right in with our DNA, who we are, what we love to do. So thanks for that. And then growing in healthy relationships, again, that's today. What does it look like to have healthy relationships? And so I'm really excited about this, and so um, I'm just going get, to get rolling here. Um, so using tact in the forgiveness process. Um, last week we worked through the first eight verses of Philemon, so grab your Bible, and um, we're going to pick up with verse, or first seven verses, we're going to pick up with verse eight, and Paul, as I study Philemon, he is rolling through a number of interesting, just his thought process is very, very interesting, all right? So well, we're going to um, review a little bit. I'm a teacher at heart, so I just got to review, right? So here we go. Um, Maybe that, okay, good. So here's, here's the story. Paul gets arrested. He's in Rome. Now you notice there's a city called Ephesus here and Colossae. And um, what happens is that um, Onesimus is from Colossae. Onesimus is serving his patron, Philemon. Okay, they have this thing in the culture called the patron-client relationship. It's, it's something, um, I'll get into that later. But anyway, Onesimus is there, and he steals some stuff from his patron, his boss, and he runs to Rome to blend in with a million people. Okay, that's what happens there. Well, Paul's in Rome in jail, and um, Onesimus, hiding out in Rome, he somehow bumps into Paul. And he accepts Jesus. And then he's got this weird thing about, oh, I'm convicted about what I did. You know, hey, Paul, what do I do? I mean, here's my story. I, I used to live in Colossae. I was serving this guy named Philemon. And, and I, I just had enough of that. And so I stole some stuff. And I, I hit the road. I went to Rome. And I met you. And, and I bumped into Jesus. And, and now I'm like, I know I'm forgiven, but I still... I just the spirit of God is I just got to deal with this what do I do and so he confides in Paul and um, Paul is like wow Philemon I know him and so um, Paul writes a letter to Philemon and says hey here's the deal this this Onesimus guy he's useful to me useful to you why don't you forgive him because I've anyway so that's kind of what we're doing but so Paul sends two guys with this personal letter to the, the man named Philemon, uh, I updated my slides, right? So um, Tychicus and Onesimus take this letter, they sail from Rome, they land at Ephesus, and it seems that Paul gave them a letter to the Ephesian church. Because remember, the prison epistles, remember every prisoner causes problems, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, anyway. So um, they drop off the letter at Ephesus, they go to Colossae, drop off the letter of Colossians to the church at Colossae, and then they delivered Paul's letter to Philemon and finally, you know, deliver Onesimus to Philemon. And um, I'm going to end today with a little snippet, a historical snippet of what happened. What happened? Because we don't really know. And it's just a historical thing. Who knows if it's really true or not, but um, that's where we're going to go. So, all right. When we're uh, focusing on these things, we, um, we have a choice to make between we focus on the relationship or do we focus on the issue, you know, and win the issue, you know, hurt the relationship, but win the issue. I talked about that last time. And so um, we saw that last week Jesus and Paul both remained relational. Um, they both returned to joy and they both endured suffering well. So that's, that's where we've been. But this, this week, starting with verse um, eight, we're going to see that Paul is using tact and skill in the forgiveness process, okay? And um, it, it's not so much that Paul has to forgive anybody. He's watching Philemon because Onesimus has come to him, and, and Paul's like, okay, so you want to confess, but we don't know what Philemon's going to do. And so it's like Paul is looking at Philemon saying, okay, I want to influence you 
but, but not control you. I, I really see the right thing for you to do. I, I, I'm very clear on what's right. You need to do this, that. But he doesn't push. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't control. He's simply, remember my illustration last week about the rope? You can't push anybody with a rope, but you can pull them gently along by your example. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> great. Drops on the glasses. All right. So, um, and, and for us, you know, we might see the, our way of doing something. Is it the right way or is it just our way? I mean, how really important is it how your husband loads the dishwasher, ladies? There we go, right? What are you doing? It's like, just be glad he's helping, okay? Or guys, how important really is it that she doesn't put the tools back in the right spot in the shop or whatever? Just be, okay. So, you know, we have to really decide, well, is the issue a big deal, okay? Do you focus on the issue and hurt the relationship or do you, do you run with that? So as we, we have a, a choice to make, what are you focusing on in a forgiveness-rich environment when there's issues, tension? Are you focusing, are you even thinking about the relationship or is it just get the, get the thing done? Now there are, <clears throat> there are times where, you know, you have to focus on the issue. If it's an emergency, you know, something, you know, there's danger, well, yeah, I'm not going to be, you know, oh, super gentle, and yeah, hey, there's a fire, and, you know, three people have already, what? Just, just run, okay? So um, I, I get that. Um, but basically in our relationships, uh, it's my observation, certainly my life, that even though I'm well-intended with the relationship sensitivity, sometimes <laughs> and I look backwards, I'm like, what happened? Okay, anyway, so but we need wisdom, all right? Where's my, there we go. We need wisdom. Um, wisdom, a lot of definitions for wisdom, but one I love is wisdom is insight into the consequences of your actions. Insight into the consequences of your actions. That is, you're thinking ahead. If I do this, what may happen? And, you know, sometimes fear enters in there, and you don't want to just take that detour and freak out over all the possible negative things. That, that's not wisdom, okay? Wisdom is simply saying, okay, hey, if I, if I spend all my money before other bills come in, hmm, how's that going to work? If I have a garden and I don't have a fence to keep the deer and rabbits out, I will wonder if I'm going to get any food. Okay, those are just crazy examples. But wisdom is insight into the consequences of your actions. So uh, in, in a forgiveness-rich environment, we want to be thinking ahead going, well, what is it going to look like if I respond in this way versus this way, okay? Mental movies that project that, and that's good. So here are a couple examples, all right, of focusing on relationships. Jesus, um, in John 12, I'm not going to be here long, so you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to zip through some illustrations. Jesus focused on the relationship in, in John 12. This is interesting. Mary took some um, expensive oil, perfume oil, anointed Jesus' feet, Judas is there, and he just comes unglued, and he says, why wasn't this oil sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? I love the text, how clear it is. Verse 6, now Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. This is classic, right? Anyway, um, as keeper of the money box, he used to steal what was put in it. So the next verse says, so Jesus said, now, wouldn't we expect Jesus to make some kind of comment about the thievery? I mean, if this is common knowledge, well, Jesus said, leave her alone. She's kept it for the day of my burial. He just passes. There's no shame. There's no pointing, yelling, screaming. I find that fascinating. Wow, interesting. Now, another question is, well, hang on here. Why did they give Judas the money if everyone knows he's a thief? I mean, that, that's kind of a, just a little bunny trail here. Probably because Jesus is putting his money where his mouth is. He, he's the one that said, hey, you can't serve God and mammon. You can have two masters. Don't put your treasure or where your treasure is there, your heart will be. And, um, and so I think Jesus is simply, he's like, this will be, be good. When I'm gone, you'll get this from history, okay? Anyway. Moving on, so th this is Jesus, I think, keeping the relationship with Jesus. As far as Jesus is concerned, that, that door's open. Now, Judas is the one that shut that, okay? Anyway, now here's one, Peter and John in Acts 4, they're not keeping the relationship as the center thing because in that context, that's not the right thing to do. Because in John 4, 
Peter and John are preaching, the priests and the Sadducees came up greatly annoyed that they're talking about Jesus, and so they charged them not to speak at all in the name of Jesus. And they said, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to do that, whatever, but we cannot stop speaking what we've seen and heard. So in this case, they are sort of sacrificing their relationship with the religious authorities. And they're okay with that. Um, They're okay being disrespected, disregarded, and um, dismissed. And, And so I guess I want to help us understand that there are times we can't please everybody. You can't run around and try to have this great relationship with everybody because there are some situations where we have to distance ourselves from, like in this context. Well, that, that's just a whole different worldview that I just cannot partake of. So we distance, okay? So we need wisdom, understanding which, which path to take and when. So we need skill, and that's what we see Paul doing here today. He's focusing on the relationship with Philemon, and so this is, we're getting into uh, verse 8 now, all right? So... <clears throat> This is the fun thing, what I see in the book of Philemon. Paul alternates between a power statement and then a persuasive statement. It's beautiful. I mean, this, this, is, this is business school 101 if you want to swing a deal, okay? Um, you know, he's like, I, I could command you, yet for love's sake, I appeal to you. Throughout this book, the whole thing, Paul is skillfully leaving the door open for Philemon to take his own steps to do what's right. Because if Paul forces him, that's not a win, right? But Paul has to, he has to paint the highway and say, that's, that would be great. I, I know you're going to go there. That's where we want to go, but I'll just let you go there, okay? It's, it's, it's really skillful. So this is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, anyway, so he, uh, he says, I could command you, and Paul is certainly his, his authority, He's a, um, he, he calls himself a prisoner. He's identifying with that. But he's an apostle, so certainly he could throw down his apostle card and say, hey, do X, Y, and Z. This is the right thing. He's been bossing the Pharisees around in the past, so you know he can do it, right? But here he, um, he really gently um, just lays it out for him to follow. So um, I could command what is right. Now, the next part of this verse says, I could command you to do what is required. Now, as I was studying this, I, I got to that phrase, and I thought, I could command you to do what is required. I thought, well, that's, that's a weird one. What's required? Well, it turns out in this culture that if a slave runs away, they could be executed. Uh, in fact, any, any citizen that, that bumps into a slave or, or finds a slave could house them and, and keep them, notify the authorities, put them on a list of, of runaway slaves, sort of like a top ten list. That's the current top ten list. Know any of these people? You need to talk to somebody, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, so um, what's required is to put them on the list. I, I could do what's required. I could command you to do that, yet for love's sake, he's taken a different path, okay? So um, anyway, the slaves, if you've found one, You could house them and then eventually get them back to their master, sell them, or turn them in. But slaves would run away, join gangs. Um, They would sometimes disguise themselves. They they were literally running for their lives. And so um, Onesimus doesn't really know what's going to happen with with this whole little experiment that Paul is going to, I'll write a letter, okay? So that's, that's a bit open. So what he's, what, there's some risks here with what's going on. <clears throat> Philemon took a risk associating with Paul because, as we see, Paul is not following the cultural norms. He's like, you know, it, the normal thing to do is write him up and, and put him on the list. Well, Paul already has a bunch of people that hate him, right? Pharisees, Sadducees, he's already outside the lines. And so if people get, uh, get hold of, of Paul's message to overthrow the cultural norms here, they would love to accuse um, him of that. So Philemon took a risk of associating with Paul. Paul took a risk when he harbored Onesimus. That's kind of what I'm already talking about. I mean, Paul's sort of, sort of taken a risk. And, and then Onesimus, how does he know what Paul is going to do? How does he know Paul isn't going to just put him on the list, turn him over? So everybody's, everybody's kind of stepping into some thin ice and some possible risk here. And um, that is not 
as you know, un uncommon when we're in a, a dicey relational situation. You're going to have to take a risk, you know, uh, assume the best, step into that with some tact. And so that's what we see here. Um, all right. So for love's sake, this is where Paul blows up that slavery context. Remember, in this culture, the Bible doesn't approve of slavery, okay? Remember the slavery we read about in the scripture is more like a, a permanent blue-collar thing where you're just permanently attaching yourself to somebody and serving them, and you don't have the freedom to just take off, but you, you're pr provided for, protected, paid, fed, and all these kind of things. So um, when Paul says, for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you, I think he's setting up a little parallel. He's saying, I've chosen to respond in love, and you should too. So um, I, think that's what he's, I think that's what he's doing. He's saying, don't do the normal cultural thing. Don't write them up. Don't put, put them on the list. And so for love's sake, uh, forgiveness is where he's going to go. Um, remember, let, let, go, to, go to verse 6. I just want to get to verse 6 and highlight that. that we, we took a look at this last week. But I think it's the heart of what Paul is after in this whole letter. I pray the sharing of your faith may be evident or may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Uh, different translation says, I pray that the faith we share, so the common faith, he wants his faith to grow. So here's, here's a nutshell is what I'm trying to say today, okay? When you're dealing with somebody that you need to, there's forgiveness in, in that context, can we look at that as an opportunity for our faith and their faith to grow? In fact, the first words could be, could be this. Hey, you know, this is a, a tough deal here. I'm really interested in my faith growing and, and your faith growing as we, ta as we talk about this. Well, that's a win, okay? It takes a little bit of the edge off. So forgiveness is highly relational, right? And we want to remain relational and not just focus on the issue and try to win and just have our way um, all right, and so I said last time too, we parent for relationship. Parenting is tough, and honestly, this is a sermon. I'm right in the middle of this, trying to sort some things out, right? And um, so we parent for relationship. Doesn't mean we just give away anything the kids want, but it does mean that I approach things with the eye of, I, I, I want us to grow closer to Jesus as we have this hard conversation, as I apologize, as you apologize, whatever it is, okay? So that's, that's, that's a win then too. And I was thinking about this, I was thinking, um, how is Jesus keeping the relationship bigger than the problem? Or how is Jesus relationally centered? And it occurred to me from the very beginning, he's like, uh, in John 12, when I'm lifted up from earth, I will draw all people to myself. He doesn't say, I will draw all people to a, you know, a, a list of ways to live or to anything like that, to, to me. And then he says, uh, I love this in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures thoroughly because you think in them you find eternal life, yet you're unwilling to come to me, that relationship. You're unwilling to come to me that you may have life. See, they locked in on the non-personal list kind of stuff, and Jesus is like, you're, you're missing the relationship. You're missing me. And finally, um, on the cross, Luke 23, criminal next to him, and Jesus says, today you will be with me. It's very relational. Everything Jesus does is relational. And so as a parent, as, a, as an employee, employer, whatever your, you know, your friction points are with, with relationships, just think about the relationship and how your actions might impact that relationship. Don't be like the guy that says, may the light from the bridges I burn guide my way. That's not going to get you very far, okay? Anyway, so another thing here, look at Paul's tone in these verses. His, his tone is, you know, for love's sake, I appeal, I appeal. He's my child. He's useful. So that tone, I would be very receptive to somebody with that tone challenging me. Very receptive. What's your tone when you're talking and having a hard conversation? Is it the power I could, and I, by golly, I will command you. Or is it a little more persuasive? Okay? So that's, um, that's interesting. You give up control and manipulation with persuasiveness. But I think that's what God is good at. 
So how about we just let him do that in his time, all right? Anyway, so moving on here, we go to verse 10. I appeal for my child whose father I became. So that's kind of a powerful thing. It's like, hey, he's my child and I'm his father. Now, we've got to enter in here uh, in a bit to, um, yeah, the patron relationship. So two comments on the child. First, he's his spiritual child. It's not his dad, but he led him to Christ, so he's, he's his child. Um, and in this culture, I've already mentioned the patron-client relationship. So the way it worked was... Um, the client would serve a patron. A patron was a popular, maybe a public official, somebody with a, with a prominent, um, prominent circles. The client would vote for their patron in elections. Um, the client brought prestige to them. So the wealthier the client was, the more the patron benefited. Then the patron would provide um, a lot of things for these clients that would be attached and serve them. Maybe they needed help finding a husband or wife. The patron would help out. Um, the patron was connected and could provide social advancement opportunities, uh, even help in a land purchase or um, military, civil office advancements. So it, it, it was just the way the world worked. And here I ran into this quote. <clears throat> no one can make a start, however, outstanding in his abilities if he lacks scope and opportunity and a patron to support him. So this is not optional in this culture. If you don't have a patron, you're stuck. You're going nowhere. This is how the world worked. Now, you already know just because the way the world works in a way doesn't make it right. It's just the way the world works, okay? So this is a situation where, where now this is where how it matters. Philemon is Onesimus' patron. <coughs> Excuse me. He's the guy that's, that's providing for him. Now, Onesimus is kind of stuck. What Paul is doing is he's ne and that relationship is like a family relationship in this culture. So, so on what grounds is Paul butting in and, and, and messing with that? So Paul has to establish, hey, Philemon, I, I'm kind of your patron. You're, in a sense, indebted to me. So on that basis, I have something to say about what you do with Onesimus. So he's making a parallel there, and that's culturally Philemon. Because when some people read the book of Philemon, they go, oh, he's, he's controlling and pushy and bossy. No. Philemon would understand this social hierarchy, and he's like, wow, okay, yeah. You are my authority in various areas, and I will hear what you have to say about what you would want me to do with my client. And so it would be, be a very logical conversation for him. So I just want to make sure we understand that. Um, and then on, in verse 19, in that culture, it was very normal for the... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It was very normal for the... Um, the, the um, patron to pay for the client's needs. And so Paul says, if he's done any wrong, um, I will pay it. So he is definitely taking on the yoke of the patron for Onesimus. And that, that's something that Philemon is going to see clearly. Okay. So um, he goes on and he says, he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to you and me. Now Onesimus, Onesimus means useful. His name means useful or beneficial. So Paul's being fun here. He says, hey, look, Mr. Useful used to be useless to you, but now he's useful to both of us. This is sort of a fun little, I think Philemon, he's like, oh, that's cute. Anyway, um, and so he moves on here, and he says um, another power statement. Oh, he is so valuable. I would love to keep him with me. Yeah, I would really love to keep him with me, but I'm going to let you figure out what you do. I see value in him. Don't you? I mean, am I an idiot thinking that he's useful? I mean, surely you can see he's useful. You see that? It's just very, very, very interesting. Okay. Um, so he goes on and says, without your consent, I don't want to do anything so that your goodness might not be by compulsion, by your own, your own accord. And so again, he allowed, this is so critical in these, these conversations about forgiveness. He's leaving the door open so Philemon can take the steps towards forgiveness on his own convictions, on his own sense of this is what I must do. Now, if Paul pushes him, sure, Philemon could do that, but he doesn't own that. He's not maturing in that. In verse 6, he wants Philemon's faith to grow. Um, 
And what if Paul just keeps Onesimus, the slave? What if Paul just like, oh, hey, I'll just, oh, hey, Philemon, found this guy. I'm just going to keep him. Well, well, then Philemon, because of the power, for di- power differential between Philemon and Paul, Philemon would be like, okay, whatever, I, I can't do anything. You're, you're my patron, so take him. He does not grow. So Paul understand. Paul could have done that. <clears throat> but he's simply saying, hey, the door's open here. You need to move through that. So this is very tricky. When we're in relationships and a hard conversation, how do we confront, have that conversation, but yet do it in such a way that, you know, I, I think you should take this direction. And if I were you, I would strongly consider that. And, you know, I'll pray for you. I'm here if you need some advice or some counsel. Instead of just, if you don't do this, you're never, you know what I mean? Okay, you, you getting that? Anyway, it's, it's super practical stuff. All right. Um, leave the door open so the person can walk through it themselves. Then we get to verse 15. 15 is really, really a treasure, all right? There's no manipulation here, but Paul says, I'll go to verse 15. 15, 15. For this, perhaps, is why. Paul is identifying, there's a reason. This is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So I love it that Paul is identifying a possible reason here. And um, what, what that tells me is that when, when we're in a difficult situation like that, we need to have spiritual eyes. We need to look at the situation and go, Lord, what is the spiritual dynamic of this situation? How is this, how could you use this in my life, in his life or her life, to mature spiritually? That is a spiritually mature question. Recognizing there's always a spiritual dynamic around difficult conversations, okay? And so that's what he's doing. Um, and, you know, Scripture is full, Romans 5, James 1, trials lead to joy. Trials lead to maturity. That's just part of the way God works, okay? So we're not surprised by that. So again, Paul, going back to his main goal, I pray that the faith you share with us may deepen your understanding of every blessing that belongs to you in Christ. That's verse 6. So he sees this as a spiritual opportunity, the reason it's a spiritual opportunity for Philemon to grow, okay? Now, it's not helpful when there's a, where there's a, um, you know, I've used to have a guest speaker come to my classes when I taught through Job and suffering, and, and this lady had lost a husband, I mean, uh, a son in a, in a tragic car accident, and um, she just shared, frankly, with all the things that helped and all the things that didn't help, and all those comments about, you know, oh, well, you'll get over it, or at, at least, you know, it wasn't two members of your family that I, it's just stupid stuff, right? And so... Basically, she just said, when there's grieving in, like that, just shut up, go there out of love, and weep with them. You, you know, just, just don't preach, don't fire up the PowerPoint. That, that's not what they're needing, okay? And it was so good for me to hear that, right, because I'm a teacher. I'm like, did you know? Look at, you know, I, I wouldn't do that, but, uh, you know, I, um, anyway. So, um, but it's good for, for us to hear that and go, yeah, what, is, what does Scripture say? Um, rejoice with those who rejoice. And exhort those who weep? No. Weep with those who weep. Wow. Powerful. Okay, so um, that's what he's doing. Well, what Paul, yeah, lo- look at the context of the need for forgiveness as an opportunity to grow. Um, usually we don't like discomfort, and so sometimes we're pretty quick to just, you know, move through it, get it over with, however, however that works. Ran into this quote. This is amazing. Uh, from Philemon. Christianity is not out to help a man escape his past and to run from it. It is out to enable a man or woman to face his past and rise above it. So um, we all have pasts. We all have bumps and bruises and things that we wish could be different. That's just life on the planet, okay? So accept that. Look at it. Receive forgiveness and redemption for it. 
and in wholeness we walk forward forgiven. It's a beautiful thing, right? Very, very beautiful thing. So uh, in doing this, Paul is going to put Philemon in a really, really weird predicament, right? E everybody around knows that Onesimus should be punished or returned. And remember the very first, the very first verse? I pointed this out last week. Um, Paul and Timothy to Philemon and Aphia and Archippus and the church. So, so there's this sense that, yeah, yeah we're watching you. We, we know we know what's going on with the Nesmas. We, we know what the culture says, but, but uh, we're, we're watching you. And, and so a little bit of weird, you know, it's kind of like when someone's performing and, and, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we're going to come watch. It's like, oh, I've got I to make sure it's good. Anyway. All right. So moving on then to verse 17, another power statement. So if, if you consider me your partner, <clears throat> well, good night. W with all they've been through, how, how could he not? How could, how could Philemon not consider Paul his partner? But, but if you do, well, then receive him as you would receive me. See, that's just another sort of, you know, a, a little leverage. But then just, I, I invite you to receive him as you would receive me. It's just how he, he moves in, but he doesn't tackle. He doesn't grab and tie up. He, he moves in, and, and then he just backs off. It's very, very tactful and very skillful. So I, I just think it's, it's fascinating, all right? Um, if he... Yeah, verse 18, if he owes you anything, um, I'll uh, pay for it. Verse 19, he says, I'll pay for it with my own hand. Another power statement. Uh, and again, this ties into that patron-client thing because he's saying, okay, as a patron, I will pay whatever he owes because I'll treat him as my client, and then you should, too, consider being like me as I'm leaning toward love. I'm not going to write him up on the FBI list. I'm, you know, so those are the things that Paul is setting an expectation here. Um, but yet leaving the door open for him to move through that on his own. But then the persuasion statement is, hey, I want some benefit from you. Well, remember, his name means useful. So I, I want some usefulness from Mr. Useful from you. So can you, can you give me something back for all I'm doing for you? Okay, that's what he's talking about. And then verse, um, this is interesting how it ends. The book ends Sort of like a crescendo. I don't know, Darren, a crescendo, does that mean like a whole bunch of stuff really fast at one time? Maybe loud. loud. Anyway, staccato maybe. Anyway, a whole bunch of stuff happens here like boom, 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 boom. I don't know music, but anyway. So um, the point is he, he has this power statement. I'm going to repay it. Remember, you owe me even yourself. That's kind of a heavy, because I led you to Christ. That's kind of a heavy thing there. So the first thing, so I want some benefit. The second thing, hey, you know what? I'm so confident of your obedience. I know you're going to do more than whatever I ask. What is Philemon supposed to do with this stuff? He, he, there, there's like nothing he can do but, but go through that open door. Right? It's a huge door. Like, I'm going to go do the right thing because Paul has been so skillful in laying it out. I don't believe he's manipulative, and that is something we're going to have to work hard at, right? Because we're, we're going to sometimes tighten down too much on this, and, and, you know, if you love me, you should do this. Like, well, hang on, that, that's not really helpful, because I'm not free now to do anything else. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So we have to be careful with that. Um, so anyway, moving on. And there's another one, verse 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. I'm hoping that through your, it's plural, I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. So again, the, he starts with plural. Everyone, a bunch of people are involved in this thing. And at the end, I just love this. Hey, I, I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your house pretty soon. And everybody knows this whole situation. And the door's wide open for you to do what we all know is right. Isn't that just great? Kind of? I mean, it's just, it's just intriguing to me. So, um, again, we really need to be careful that we don't cross over into manipulation with this. We need to lovingly set forth the path. And the hardest thing for me, then, is to just that, that part where you back up and you don't push the person through the door, right? That's the hardest part because I can see it so clearly, right? It's like, well, well go, go, go now. <laughs> No, I need to just wait, Lord Jesus, would you work in that person's faith? Would their faith grow? And leave that to him. And, and that could, isn't that hard? It's like, you're not through the door yet. What, what's wrong? Go, go. Do you need some help? Okay, you, you get the point. So, and then, so, so this is his, um, his whole deal. Now, 
This is a challenge. And if you remember nothing else from the sermon, this is worth the price of admission, okay? I'm telling you. Um, normally, in our culture, generally speaking, we uh, sometimes Christians think this way. They're like, well, you need to believe what I believe, and, and then you need to behave like I behave, and then we'll accept you. Is that the way Jesus operates? It is not. Jesus to Matthew, the tax collector, hey, come with me. Belong with me. What? And as you belong, yeah, I'll tell you who I am. You, you, you believe. And as you believe, your behavior is going to get dialed in. But this makes me nervous and uncomfortable because I, I'm out of control. I would very much like to make you do this, that, and the other. You see what I'm saying? So I really want to challenge you just to look at those things, maybe write those two things down or whatever, and just go, how do I operate with my family, with my friends, with whoever? Do, you, do, do I expect them to believe first, or can I hang out with the people that Jesus hung out and say, hey, belong with me, follow me. And as we march through this together, you're going to figure this out. Wow, that's profound. Really, really profound. So um, I, I love this just because um, Jesus is challenging them to remain relational in the midst of a, of a charged, forgiveness-rich situation. So I don't know what situations you have, um, but I do know that you're going to have them. It's just the nature of the world, right? And so, um, especially with family members, sometimes those seems to be the hardest, right? I can, I can put on the good face for a lot of different situations, but the family members do 24-7, in and out, in and out, in and out, especially on holidays for whatever reason. So, um, just challenge you to go, are you okay if someone near and dear to you believes differently? Or is that a roadblock? Do they hear the message, I will not accept you until you agree with me? Even though we never say that, do they get that message? You see what I'm saying? And it's super hard, isn't it? To know that they believe or act differently and yet welcome them. Remember the prodigal son? The part I love about the prodigal son is the father's response. Sure, he runs after him and all that. But when the older brother starts to whine and complain, the father's comment is so instructive. The father says to the older brother, Oh, son, you've always had access to me. I, I, I've always been here. All the Father wants is a relationship. We're the ones that get all weird and, and, and focus on all these other things, and we miss the relationship, okay? So that's, uh, that's, in, that's instructive to me, all right? So um, <clears throat> here historically is how it might end, the whole Onesimus thing. What happened? What did Philemon do? All right. So I was studying this, and there's a, uh, an early church leader named Ignatius, who's actually a disciple of John the Apostle, super old guy. And um, he was on his way to Rome to be executed, and he wrote a letter to the Ephesian church while he's going to Rome to be executed. He said this, I received therefore your whole multitude, that is the whole church, in the name of God, in the person of Onesimus, whose love surpasses words, who is besides in the flesh your bishop. I pray that you may love him with a love according to Jesus Christ and that you may be like him. For blessed is he who granted unto you, worthy as you are, to possess such a bishop. Not many names, people in the first century named Onesimus. And so it could be, it's not absolute, but the, the character of this Onesimus seems to fit. And if you daydream a bit about Onesimus, you know, Philemon forgiving him, connections with Paul, I mean, he'd be trained He'd be uh, you know, hanging out with Paul, traveling to Ephesus, and you know that, that road was common. It's not hard to see how he would rise and, and be a pillar of the church. And, and with a story like that, I mean, can, can you be our men speaker? Can you preach at this conference or whatever, right? So he would, perhaps. So tradition does hold that Philemon set him free. And um, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> I don't know, it didn't come to me, so... Um, all right, so um, anyway, seriously, um, I, 
I love this book. And again, that was a little different take on Philemon. It was looking at Paul's tension between how do I get Philemon to do the right thing? And so I think that's a, a legitimate angle to look at the book with. Obviously, forgiveness is huge. Next week, we're going to take a look, uh, the final week, I'm a little series on forgiveness here. Um, I'm going to look at David's final words. What was that about? Anyway, well, that's, that's next week. And I, I could just, do you have time? Should I just? No. Anyway, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for, wow, you, you just love us. You accept us. You, you open that door and your spirit prompts us. You don't push us through the door. Uh, you want us to walk through that door of our own accord because we're convinced of your goodness, your love, and your grace. And so personally, me and everyone in this room, I pray that that we would see the doors of obedience, the, the doors of attitude that you set open for us, that we would move through those. And, and also for the relationships we have, would you give us that skill and that maturity and wisdom to do the same thing, to, to come alongside someone lovingly, not throw down the power and start pushing people around, but somehow in that moment that, that your spirit will illuminate to, to lay out clearly the path that seems right and do so through the affirmation sandwich you're good at this here's what we should do you're good at this whatever whatever your spirit takes so um we we are grateful for who you are what you've done for us and may our treatment of people around us really reflect how you treat and love us so we love you and we're grateful for uh, who you are what you've done amen